Hello, everybody, and welcome. And thank you for joining us both online and in person. And this is the third session in the Land Term Seminars of the Martin Center Seminar Series. And this is the, I think it's a 54th edition of the Martin Center Seminar Series, which means that we are running the seminars for 54 years. And we are, we are really proud that we have hosted many great names, and we are, and we are delighted to add to that Rita Grad. To Gark, and she is going to present us on the topic um, transitioning, yeah, transitioning to net zero. And my name is Hamida, and along with a small team of students, Jerry, Sam, and Michael, which is not here, who is not here yet, uh, we are curating the seminars. So, uh, just a note on the format of the seminar. We, Rito will present us for 45 to an hour, and then we will have another 15 to, an hour, to 30 minutes for Q&A, which will be between our online attendees and uh, in-person audience. And I'll quickly introduce Rito, and then uh, we will get started. Uh, Rito leads a practice and focuses on sustainable system and earth sport, sports team. Her work is to explore the transformation required for future cities, infrastructure, and energy and resource to meet sustainability goals. Often applying the system approaches to analyze and identify key areas for impact. She focuses on shaping and delivering strategic research, visioning, scenario planning, and effective stakeholder engagement in her work. Rito was a fellow at the World Economic Forum in 2022, working to lead a major research and a stakeholder engagement program on circular economy in the from net zero carbon system cities. She has over 10 years of experience working across multiple disciplines, including city and transport planning and strategy, civil engineering and energy and climate change policy. That being said, uh, thank you, Rito, again for joining us today and Lord Zalgers. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a research program that we've been working on at Arab within the Foresight team for the past three years almost. Um, and we've started to publish bits of this research and I think that's um, how I got in touch with uh, Cambridge University. Um, so for those of you who maybe don't know Arab, we're an engineering consulting firm. Um, we do design planning alongside engineering and we generally focus on built environment. And so within Arab, uh, I sit in our foresight team and this team specifically is focused on looking at the future of different industries and different sectors. Um, so we use a range of methods and we primarily focus on delivering uh, research and thought leadership and advisory services for our clients. Um, so this piece of research that I'm going to talk about today is um, actually part of um, an internally funded program, uh, thought leadership program that we did. And when we were asked to work on the topic of net zero, um, the first reflection that uh, the team had was that there's so much already being said about the subject, what value can we add in on uh, the topic? And there's already so much being said uh, on it within ARA. And one reflection that we had was, um, we've actually been talking about this problem for at least the past two decades, if not three decades. And for some reason, the problem that we're trying to manage has only gotten worse uh, in that time. Why is that? Um, and that was kind of the premise uh, that um, uh, our program and our research has centered on. Um, so we focus on, in this program, on looking at how can we shift from this period of very limited to no change to a period of transformational change, which is ultimately what we need if we want to get to net zero uh, goals globally across different sectors in time. Um, one, one thought about net zero and one reason why it's such a complicated agenda is because it's not a focused and contained problem that's looking at one thing. It's um, a metric that um, kind of forces us to rethink every aspect of society. It's shaped and is impacted by everything that we do. And so what is the right way to actually take it on? It needs the use of technological, economic, behavioral mechanisms um, for us to be able to get to this goal. Um, and um, 
the way that we focused kind of our research was around four key statements that we um, argue highlight some of the fundamental sort of systemic barriers in us getting to net zero. And each of these statements takes a different perspective in terms of how we look at the topic of net zero. So the first statement, I'll, I'll walk through each of these because essentially every statement focuses um, and is the center of uh, a research report that we um, developed as part of the program. So the first statement is looking at the topic of net zero from a global perspective. Um, the second statement is looking at sectors. Uh, the third is looking at the individual person, and the fourth is looking at the role of government and business. This first statement that's looking at the topic of net zero from a global point of view um, is saying that we live in a very globally interdependent world. And um, if we don't establish mechanisms to really think about the net zero problem from that perspective, we'll only be shifting the problem from one place to another rather than actually addressing the root cause. Um, and within this uh, bit of research, we focus specifically on the agriculture and industry or manufacturing sectors. Um, they, these two sectors account for an estimated half of global greenhouse gas emissions. And when you think about it, um, these two sectors are not confined to national borders. They practically take place across different borders. And um, the diagram that I have up is looking at just a simple chocolate bar and looking at the ingredients that go into that chocolate bar, which is made up of maybe six or seven ingredients and yet have a footprint um, that spans five or six different countries. If we start to think about um, who is responsible um, and what the responsibility of an individual nation is to reduce emissions in, let's say, just the agriculture and industry sectors, uh, once you start looking at the data and once you start looking at the actual role a nation might play in that picture, um, it suddenly becomes a very complicated question to answer who is responsible for cutting emissions. Do you look at imports and exports? Do you look at the distribution of population across the world? Um, what is the right way to allocate responsibility for reducing emissions. It's not as simple as the activities that take place within the nation's borders. And while we confront this challenge of um, looking at the topic of net zero from a global perspective and recognizing these global interdependencies, we also face the challenge of um, recognizing that every nation in itself faces very different immediate near-term priorities and challenges. And I won't go through all of this, but something that we do in our research is we take a selection of countries that have um, that are witnessing maybe the greatest growth or have um, uh, led to the highest cumulative greenhouse gas emissions so far or um, have the highest greenhouse gas emissions annually at the moment. Basically, countries that are necessary to include in the dialogue to cut emissions. And we look at what their current context looks like, what their key challenges on the ground are, uh, what their priorities are. Uh, to kind of separate um, us from thinking about net zero as a standalone issue and integrate that more with what um, that country is actually trying to do. So as an example, Brazil is um, a major influencer in global trade and particularly agriculture. The UK has made some great progress in reducing its emissions so far, but it's also um, the country with some of the highest um, consumption patterns on a per capita basis. Uh, China is experiencing major growth, it's a major player in global trade, um, and climate change could potentially completely change uh, its neighbors and uh, increase risk um, uh, due to changing resources and vulnerable systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The only current mechanism that we have to reconcile uh, the climate change problem on a global platform at the moment is the UN uh, Conference of Parties. And, um, Unfortunately, to date, they haven't achieved as much progress as we've needed them to. Uh, the nationally determined contributions are a country's kind of plan of actions on how they'll uh, achieve greenhouse gas emission targets in the near term. And so far, what we've seen is that uh, the guidelines on how countries report how they'll achieve these reductions and uh, track progress are very loose in general. So countries can choose their own timeframes to set targets, even though that wasn't the intention of the Paris Agreement. They can uh, postpone uh, progress to far off uh, timeframes. 
and ultimately because um, every country kind of has autonomy on how it's choosing to set targets, there's a great degree of inconsistency and um, ultimately the ability to measure that progress and compare um, who's doing and who's on track uh, with what they're supposed to be uh, doing. So the key kind of premise of this bit of the research is to say um, we need climate action to be globally aligned and we need global consistency in terms of the sectors that we're trying to manage, whether that's agriculture or, or whether that's manufacturing uh, and our consumption. Um, and we also need to be mindful of the specific challenges uh, and urgencies that different countries face on the ground and think about how can we create this border agnostic mechanism while allowing for that uh, contextual variation. That's a very difficult uh, challenge to overcome. And we argue that that is one of the reasons why we've uh, failed to make the amount of progress that we need to on uh, climate change. But we simple, supplement kind of uh, this entire body of work with a series of case studies that look at where we've previously been successful in overcoming challenges such as these and what can we draw out from them? What are some of the lessons learned um, that can help us propel our progress on that zero? So a few case studies that are relevant in particular to this need for global coordination that we can look to for inspiration, albeit um, it wasn't the same challenge that they faced and um, the challenge that these particular instances faced uh, wasn't quite at the same scale. But the Montreal Protocol, which is a global agreement uh, looking to manage the damage that was being done to the ozone layer, uh, was ultimately successful, work continues. Um, and one of the key reasons why it was successful was um, the establishment of clear scientific evidence, um, large scale action from public, um, using art and media to actually communicate with the general public and um, create the urgency for action, firm legislative action, um, negotiation and partnership between industry and regulators. Um, these were some of the key factors that ultimately led to the success of the Montreal Protocol. The move towards nuclear disarmament, again, work continues um, on this sphere, but um, uh, today nuclear arsenals are estimated to be one fifth of the size that they were 50 years ago. So significant progress has been made and it was also an agenda that required firm international coordination. And once again, it was civic movements, social pressure, the support of influential voices, even in the scientific community, people like Einstein, the convening power of major international institutions, um, and the coming to close with some very risky situations um, that brought uh, major nations close to war uh, and confronting that real danger that ultimately led to this realization um, that we could not continue going on the same path that we were. Um, in a different sense, uh, the scaling of solar energy and the massive cost revolution that's happened has also been a form of international coordination. Um, certain countries kicked off um, the innovation and the technology, others took it up and managed to scale it and make it cheaper. Um, and other countries like Germany put in reforms in place um, that got the consumers on board to actually trial um, and create the demand for this technology to then further boost uh, production and innovation. Um, the second part of our research uh, focuses on sectors um, and essentially what we mean when we say sectors are um, the kind of organizing of the economy to pro provide certain functions to society. So for example, the energy sector, the transport sector, the building sector. And oftentimes these spheres become uh, the focus areas for delivering climate action and for setting net zero targets. Uh, because they entail organizational and governance parties. Uh, but what often happens is governments declare a high level target saying the transport sector is going to get to net zero by 2050, but we actually leave things running on the ground business as usual. So this is a breakdown of uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by sector um, for the UK. And uh, what happens uh, when we kind of declare these high level targets, but we make no changes in terms of the actual governance and organization of these sectors is that we fall behind, practically speaking, on our targets. Um, and that's because a lot of the challenges that come to the surface in addressing net zero are kind of cross organizational. And a lot of what these sectors are focused on is um, 
delivering on kind of uh, very segmented things like uh, safety or operations. Um, and they fail to, um, with this kind of oncoming of net zero targets, uh, the sectors have sort of failed to reorganize themselves to take ownership over some of the cost cutting issues that net zero provokes. So for example, um, providing a net zero solution and energy that uh, is affordable for consumers. There isn't any one single party that can really take on this issue currently in the current um, structure of the energy sector, but it's a massive issue that's keeping the energy sector from making as much progress as it needs to. Um, so what we did in this bit of research is um, we advocated for this uh, systems view and systems mapping exercise to kind of allow people to take a step back and actually think about how does this sector that we're trying to move towards this one big goal actually function today if we thought about its key priorities and its key governance. The transport sector in itself is incredibly complex. Um, every single mode has its own kind of governing parties and each of those different governing parties and organizations uh, prioritize different things. And none of those things are necessarily environmentally oriented. And so very quickly, when you start to look at the practical kind of workings of the sector, you realize that um, uh, there isn't enough oversight and ownership and accountability on the ground to actually deliver on this high level target that we've set. Um, and how can we change that? So we did something similar for the energy sector. Um, um, and one of the kind of key overarching challenges that we highlighted for the energy sector, I mentioned consumer affordability. It was also um, the fact that there is a major um, amount of uncertainty in terms of what technological solutions the energy sector can rely on to scale in time to say that that will be the pathway to net zero and therefore that should be um, the solution that we invest in to deploy massive amounts of infrastructure. And so there is no one entity that's necessarily responsible for um, positioning itself to, um, to kind of um, go beyond that level of uncertainty and start to make decisions within uh, a set time frame. And the energy sector in the UK is actually a good example because they are beginning to recognize those overarching challenges and they are beginning to um, rethink their structure and rethink ownership, change um, their decision-making that's traditionally been more near-term oriented to being longer-term oriented. Uh, but there are some significant challenges uh, in thinking about how, how even if a new body is um, created, how it sits in relation to these existing um, stakeholders. Um, but again, this idea of reorganizing or remobilizing an entire sector system-wide nationally to meet a goal um, isn't unprecedented and it has happened before. Uh, if we think about the rollout of the NHS in the UK, um, that was an entire huge reorganization of how healthcare services were accessed by people and delivered to them. Uh, it required rethinking how uh, doctors offered services. Um, it entailed the centralization of decision-making around healthcare, uh, which wasn't previously the case. Um, and it was uh, helped by the articulation of clear alternatives, a clear assessment of what the issues with the existing system were and how um, it could be transformed, what the options on the table were. Um, it took a lot of powerful and persistent advocates uh, over decades and um, strategic negotiation with those who were opposed to um, reforming the sector to understand what was it that they were worried about and what was a way to come to a compromise to appease them. Uh, the UK has actually also previously made an energy transition going from town gas to natural gas, which required making changes to infrastructure, required changing, uh, again, decision-making powers and centralizing that decision-making, um, but also then leaving room for innovative solutions from the private sector, namely public-private partnership, um, catering to people who, um, who had limited resources and lower incomes. Um, The third part of our research looks at um, the individual. So it looks at uh, what is the role of the individual when we talk about net zero. Oftentimes uh, when we hear about climate action, 
we think about um, uh, the role of each of us being to do the best we can, to do the right thing kind of independently on our own, uh, which can actually make the topic of net zero very overwhelming for most people. And what we kind of argue in this section is that it's actually very difficult for the average individual to usually know what the right choice is because net zero is ultimately actually about every single choice we make. It's about how do we get to work? It's about what do we eat? What do we buy? Um, and if, uh, if we had to independently think about what the right choice was in each of these contexts, uh, it would be very difficult. Oftentimes uh, it might be impractical, inconvenient, unaffordable. So we start out um, this bit of research by talking about what is sustainable consumption. And we say that actually it's about favoring products that were made uh, sustainably uh, or favoring services that are sustainable. And it's also about consuming them in a way that's sustainable. So in a way that um, matches their natural replenishment, um, that minimizes waste. Um, and if we think about who's in control of these things, well, actually um, the creation of products, the delivery of services and how sustainable that is, is determined by the market, by manufacturers and retailers. And consuming in a manner that's sustainable is in the hands of consumers, uh, but it's also heavily influenced by the parameters that consumers face, which is how expensive is something, how practical is it for um, you to buy something new versus to invest um, in repairing what you already have. And what we find in our research is that the current market isn't necessarily pushing people to make the right choice uh, in most of those circumstances. And in fact, industry often overproduces um, and generates this waste because it's uh, cheap enough to do so because they're operating at such a scale. And so some facts about uh, the fashion industry overproducing about 30 to 40% each season. Um, uh, a research in 2017 done across 20 countries showed um, 13 million pounds of food waste because of overproduction, just looking at a small subset of commercial kitchens. Um, the consumer shouldn't have to go out of their way to make the right choice if we want to get to net zero. Um, and currently in the state that we're operating, actually uh, people do have to go out of their way. Uh, because a sustainable choice is often an alternative, it's a more expensive alternative, and it's a niche alternative. Um, so research shows that sustainable products only represented 17% of the market in 2022. Um, so for us to successfully transition to net zero, um, sustainable options actually need to become the default. And what we did in this research uh, was we looked at um, a series of questions and we um, took two kind of common everyday products. So we looked at tea uh, and we looked at smartphones and we um, thought about, well, we, we did research on how easy is it actually um, to know what's the right thing to do um, in each of these cases. So the first question that we asked in this research was, is the sustainable option clearly defined for the consumer? So when you buy tea, do you know what the most sustainable option is? When you buy a smartphone, is it very clear to know what the most sustainable option is? Um, and we found um, for tea, for example, um, tea can be marketed as sustainable if it uh, follows one or all of the criteria that would truly define for it to be sustainable. For example, if a brand used uh, plastic-free tea bags or if it engaged in fair trade um, cultivation practices, um, whether it did all of those things or if it only did one of those things, it could still market itself as a sustainable brand. So consumers really have no way of knowing um, how good that brand is. Um, uh, in the case of smartphones, the most sustainable thing you can do arguably is to keep the phone that you already have for as long as it's functioning. Um, and yet the way that phones are marketed and sold, it doesn't necessarily encourage us to do that. Um, uh, phone manufacturing accounts for 80% of a phone's emissions and um, the idea of durability and making our phones last for as long as we can is not really um, the culture that's promoted by companies. Second question that we looked at in this context was, are sustainable choices available at the right scale and level of convenience? Um, so less than 7% of tea uh, that's produced worldwide by estimates is actually complying with sustainability standards. 
keeping in mind those sustainability standards are already uh, uncertain and unclear. Uh, smartphones, uh, refurbished phones are often not generally considered an option by mainstream consumers. And there are many things that manufacturers do to impede that. Um, they make phones very difficult to repair. Um, there's kind of planned obsolescence within products. Uh, oftentimes, uh, many parts of the phone will have pure, uh, poor durability and uh, will easily be damaged. Um, are sustainable choices available at the right price? Uh, sustainable tea is actually becoming popular, uh, but it does tend to be more expensive. And a lot of the tea drink drinking population uh, in the world is in low or middle income countries. Um, so there is actually more of a market uh, for sustainable tea, fashionably sustainable tea in rich countries, uh, but less so in, uh, in countries where it's greatly consumed. Um, and that makes a difference in how practical that option is. Um, uh, and smartphones, again, repairing your phone is often uh, as expensive um, as potentially buying a new one. And so consumers, again, have no financial incentive to do the right thing. So despite, um, despite a lot of um, kind of propaganda and hearsay around, um, you know, individual actions counting up, what we argue through this research is that actually the stakes are against the individual in trying to make the right choice practically in everyday situations. Some of this is changing in certain contexts with rising awareness, uh, but it's still, uh, it's still an upward battle. Um, and in this context, um, some of the case studies that we looked at in the past. So we know that the net zero transition requires action from consumers. Uh, it requires us to rethink our behaviors and consider new ways of doing things that we're used to um, doing in one way. Um, and that kind of massive behavioral change isn't impossible. It actually has taken place um, in the past but it's taken place under a clear set of um, kind of common sense uh, conditions. So the rise of cycling in cities is something that no one had really predicted. In the transportation field, we always talk about autonomous vehicles. And yet one of the biggest changes that's happened in the transport field is this uptick in cycling across uh, cities globally. And that has been the result of decades long uh, rigorous grassroots advocacy uh, to, to promote the environmental benefits of cycling and walking and also to promote the environmental uh, impact and damage caused by cars. Uh, it's taken strong and agile top level leadership in a lot of these cities. Um, uh, it's uh, taken kind of a willingness to experiment with grassroots solutions. Um, a willingness to trial and take risks, and it's taken a lot of policy planning investment that's ultimately led um, to this recent change that we've seen. Another example that doesn't immediately come to mind, but that's really interesting to look at, is what's happened with the tobacco industry in the US um, in the 90s. And this issue by no means is again resolved, um, but anti-smoking efforts in the US in the 90s led to a 50 7% drop in California um, and 27% drop overall on average in the US. And this was a result of high profile scientific evidence, landmark litigation uh, over decades, uh, grassroots advocacy once again, a firmly outlined government policy and plan that was coupled with funding um, to promote kind of targeted education programs around smoking prevention. Uh, some support resources for people that are already smoking, a whole change in culture in terms of uh, where you're allowed to smoke, an increase in taxes on tobacco. Um, so what we see in these case studies is that actually if you want to get people on board in the masses, um, it takes a multi-pronged approach um, to bring about that change uh, so that that change is actually perceived as beneficial by people uh, and not something that they have to go out of their way to do. In looking at these kind of um, three uh, three focus areas that I've outlined, which is um, this issue of global interdependencies, this complexity of governance within the sectors that we're trying to decarbonize, this need to bring the individual everyday person on board, um, it becomes very clear um, where we need to start taking action from. And um, in the final part of our research, we talk about the role of government and business. Um, 
And the way that we kind of outline our research in this section is we look at these key levers of influence that we argue government has and key levers of influence um, that business have in their power. And um, we kind of um, use research using um, top 20 Fortune 500 companies and governments across the world um, to show is government or is business doing everything they can with respect to these levers of influence or are there still gaps which are truly acting as barriers in us getting to net zero? And what we find, um, again, this, this research is quite vast and I, I won't get into all of the details, is that there are some quite significant gaps. Um, so uh, a set of kind of um, graphics and some, some stats to uh, reinforce why big business is a legitimate focus when we talk about action on net zero. So some of the world's uh, top uh, companies, this is a anonymized list of Fortune 500 companies, uh, the red bars that you see compared to some of the world's biggest cities and comparing their emissions. And obviously when you start to look into how emissions are taken into account, um, you know, it's not that these companies are producing products that we use in our everyday lives. But the point here is to say, Actually, cities are very complicated because cities have uh, democratic systems and lots of individual players and a lot, a lot of complexity. And it actually takes a lot to change a city. But a, a business um, actually has a fairly tight decision-making body. And if it decided to make a change, it could be relatively streamlined and it could lead to massive change uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, and so the, the kind of purpose of us showing this graphic is to say that uh, businesses can have a lot of power in shifting the dial on us getting to net zero. Um, if they used all their levers of influence, uh, we looked at global greenhouse gas emissions um, and looked at their breakdown in terms of commercial emissions versus private emissions. And again, 80%, if you looked at it from that lens, is commercial emissions. Big business span across every sector that we're trying to decarbonize. Um, and some of the lovers of influence uh, we look at uh, in our research is uh, businesses setting business models, uh, designing products and services, businesses lobbying, uh, businesses setting up supply chains, uh, using their marketing power, uh, and then also in how they manage and mitigate impact practically, how they support their local economies. Um, and some kind of examples that I'll offer um, from that research is um, one of the levers that we explore uh, is around business models. And we question, are some business models inherently at odds with climate action? If the business model is to sell as much as you possibly can, um, regardless of the environmental cost, can that ever actually be aligned with a net zero goal? Um, and if you did have an alternative business model um, uh, in mind, do conditions actually exist today for businesses to wholly uptake those or is something missing? So for example, if you looked at a circular economy model where we try to reuse um, and repair everything that we make, if a business started doing that today, on average, it would find actually it's increased its cost and the product it's suddenly putting out to market um, costs a lot more than what its competitor is putting out. And, um, what we argue here through the research is to say that um, it's, it's very hard for a business to get to net zero in today's operating conditions. It has to adopt the business model that it's currently using. Um, but these business models need to change if we want to get to net zero. And government here has a major role and a gap to fill by creating the conditions for businesses to then practically be able to say, actually, maybe we can start to think about these alternative models um, for uh, putting out our products in the market. So for a circular economy to exist, government could incentivize um, a common set of kind of repair services. Um, it could create certain mandates or incentives for a majority of businesses to start to adopt elements of a circular economy so that the one business uh, that does doesn't suddenly make itself uncompetitive, but um, there are conditions that exist in the external market um, provided by government that level that playing field and that encourage uh, the majority of the industry to try something different. Um, something else that we look at is how businesses manage their supply chains, that being a lever of influence. Um, 
So research shows that one fifth of the world's uh, total greenhouse gas emissions are from the supply chains of multinational companies. Um, and there was something around um, like 80% of a uh, MNE's uh, carbon, carbon footprint is actually from its supply chain. So if businesses aren't obligated to manage their supply chains, um, they're actually foregoing uh, the majority of the environmental impact that they're influencing in the market, albeit that they don't technically own. Um, so a graphic that we have up here is looking at what goes into making an iPhone. Um, again, you see a very similar kind of story as what we saw in the Cadbury bar example, which was a globally uh, distributed, very diverse network of players that contribute um, to the coming of being of this one product. Um, so when we looked at what our business is doing to manage the supply chains, we found that out of uh, the top 20 Fortune 500 companies in 2022, only eight um, actually had clearly defined programs um, to manage the sustainability of their suppliers. So this is something that's um, getting more and more attention and uh, there's more and more kind of jargon that, um, that allows businesses to say that they recognize that this is an issue, but there's actually very little still that's being done even by top companies um, to address this aspect of emissions. And that is also because it's incredibly complex, uh, but it's also because they have very little incentive um, so are there sufficient incentives and resources for businesses to robustly report and manage their impact, their suppliers' impact? And we review some of the key frameworks. Um, not all of them are up here on this table. Um, and we look at what some of the strengths and limitations of these frameworks are. And um, what we kind of say in this research is that uh, these frameworks have been great in, um, in kickstarting action on climate and in getting widespread industry engagement. Uh, but there is a significant, significant gap in the impact that they're actually ha having because they're voluntary, which means businesses can choose what they want to disclose and what they don't want to disclose, which means there's a lot of variability around uh, what different businesses are reporting. It's very difficult to actually track true progress. Um, and um, therefore, you can, you can more easily make it seem like you're making progress um, uh, then actually validating that you're making a change. Um, so one, one kind of framework that we looked at closely was the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is a fantastic initiative. It's a huge step in the right direction, um, but it's uh, still quite limited in terms of its effectiveness because reporting companies, like I said, are um, reporting information that's high, highly variable, inconsistent in quality. Um, you have uh, the privilege of setting targets as you choose. So sometimes you can set a target that you know you will meet, even if that target isn't actually uh, necessarily sufficient when you take into considerations of the wider industry. Um, another lever of influence that we looked at in this research was around lobbying um, and looking at whether the activity of businesses um, in how they lobby and influence legislation and political actions matches up with, um, with what they're saying they want to do in terms of net zero and climate action. Um, and there's a lot of research um, that shows that this again um, is misaligned. So uh, fact here that for every $1 spent on supporting climate change, there were $10 spent on anti-climate lobbying between 2000 and 2016. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence around some of the biggest oil companies, I think it was Shell and BP, um, who both have net zero targets, but at the same time have um, uh, actively taken steps to dilute legislation uh, on climate, uh, uh, on advocating for continued permits for oil and gas. Um, uh, there's just a, a lot of data kind of um, across different resources that we looked at that, um, that stated that uh, uh, kind of companies' statements are uh, significantly misaligned uh, with what they're actually uh, pushing government for. Um, and there is currently no regulation, again, a gap from government uh, to prevent them from doing so. And then finally, in that same bit of research, we looked at the levers of influence that government has um, and a big role that government plays, um, as I hinted earlier, is in creating those conditions and that level playing field and managing the risks that stakeholders would face in the first 
that they take to get to net zero. So a lot of those levers of influence are going beyond just target setting and visioning, but actually um, creating accountability and enforcement, so establishing firm institutions and processes to manage uh, issues and monitoring related to net zero, creating safety nets for communities that would be impacted by the transition, um, providing funding and investment into net zero related initiatives, uh, which is happening in some spaces and is uh, being undone in others. Um, so have governments established enforceable mechanisms for a rapid net zero transition is a question that we ask in this bit of research. And um, this is a space that is changing. So the graph is showing um, climate change related litigation in just the US and how much it's gone up, which is a positive trend because as we saw in the tobacco industry case study um, and various other case studies, litigation is often sometimes what leads to major uh, milestone change. Um, there's a lot of existing uh, legislation that's often not highlighted um, that actually needs reform and review and is being misused uh, to prevent climate action. And um, the investor settlement dispute um, is one of, one of these clauses in international kind of trade agreements um, that is being used by oil and gas companies um, to prevent uh, countries uh, foreign countries that are taking action to close down these industries uh, from being able to do so. Uh, and I had a stat in my notes um, that I can't access now um, that was kind of showing, I think 10 out of 12 um, major cases have all been in the favor of oil and gas companies um, in recent years. This graph uh, unfortunately shows uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and so while government investment in net zero is continuing, so is the direct funds and financing um, towards fossil fuel. Um, it ebbs and flows, it's mildly reduced, but it's uh, still significant. Um, so what our kind of general research showed is that you can see now why that graph I showed in the beginning, which just showed emissions going up is the way it is. It's because we've started talking about climate change more and more in these recent decades, but actually a lot of the fundamental barriers that I've described um, are significantly out of place. Um, that's not meant to leave us kind of completely disheartened and say, we're never going to be able to resolve this. Um, and I think that's why those uh, case studies that we looked at, looking at kind of previous instances of transformational change in the past are powerful because we have come across these barriers in the past and we have been able to get over them. And I think if we study those more closely and if we recognize um, the issues and the gaps uh, more transparently um, as we do in the study and combine the two, then we can more strategically and effectively make progress on net zero. And I think some of that is starting to happen, but I, um, I think at least on the part of government, at least on the part of um, kind of these international forums, a lot of, there is a lot of jargon on, and a lot of kind of slogans being thrown around and there isn't enough of a focus on some of these big systemic complex challenges that we've outlined in this research um, and what countries can do uh, to overcome them. I don't know how to go back, but um, I wanted to kind of summarize um, those four key statements. So global interdependencies need recognition for effective climate action sectors that we're trying to um, that we're trying to decarbonize are highly complex and their complexity needs to be recognized and sufficient governance needs to be put in place to decarbonize them. Uh, sustainable choices need to be made the default for individual consumers. Um, uh, they need to be affordable, they need to be practical, they need to be convenient for people for them to be able to uptake them and government and business need to start using all levers of influence in their power. Um, to actually drive the change to net zero uh, beyond just setting targets and visions. And this is a list of the case studies um, that we've looked at in total as part of this research, where we say we've overcome some of those barriers, that those barriers of effective global coordination, of transforming sectors and complex systems, of making people change their habits in masses, um, and um, government business coming together to take a firmer stance to drive action. Thank you.